All right, good evening. Welcome to our uh, sixth class in our prayer book series. Um, we're going over the 2019 uh, Anglican Church in North America's Book of Common Prayer. Um, this class is hosted by St. Thomas Anglican Church. Uh, we are a young church in Athens, Georgia, um, a vibrant, disciple-making, liturgical church that is all about the gospel. Uh, for more information about St. Thomas, you can visit our website, stacathens.org, stackathens.org, or we use that STAC Athens for most of our social media channels as well. Uh, my name is Daniel Atkinson. I'm the rector uh, of St. Thomas, and it's great to be with you tonight. Um, here's what we're looking at. This is a rather unique section that I really enjoy preparing. Um, we are going to be looking at the penitential resources uh, in the prayer book, ways that we can repent and confess our sins and be assured of the Lord's forgiveness. Um, and just to orient you, uh, after tonight, we're going to spend a few weeks on the Sunday services in the prayer book, kind of walking through what those look like. Um, and then we'll do a catch-all the last week, some of the rites and ceremonies, the marriage service, the burial service, some of the special services um, that are in the prayer book. We'll, we'll go over some of those um, in a survey format kind of as well. So um, we have used this slide before. We looked at this when we were going through the daily office of uh, morning prayer and evening prayer, but I want to reiterate it again as we think about the penitential resources. Uh, St. John Chrysostom once said, be ashamed when you sin, uh, not when you repent. Um, actually, let me expand that a little bit so you get the context. Um, he's actually preaching a sermon on repentance and almsgiving. And he says, do not be ashamed to enter again into the church. Be ashamed when you sin. Do not be ashamed when you repent. Pay attention to what the devil did to you. There are two things, sin and repentance. Sin is a wound. Repentance is a medicine. Just as there are for the body wounds of medicine, so for the soul are sin and repentance. However, sin has the shame and repentance possesses the courage. Um, and I think that outlook is a key starting point as we think about these resources in the prayer book. Uh, sometimes when people hear penitence or think about being penitential, um, there's an element of shame or, or self-punishment or self-loathing in that. Um, and that's not what we're talking about at all. Um, I would actually echo uh, St. John Chrysostom that repentance um, requires and possesses courage. This, it's, it takes courage to be honest about our sins and to bring those um, to the Lord. And if you read through the prayer book, it assumes that we will sin. And the biggest question it really asks is, what will we do with our sin? Uh, will we hide from the Lord, um, like the, what we have in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned and they hide from the presence of the Lord? Um, when we sin, will we avoid church, or will we neglect our devotional life? Um, or when we sin, will we actually turn to the Lord for forgiveness and healing? That outlook is key as we think about these resources. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 in the New Testament, um, we read this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, Pastor Tim Keller, who recently retired from Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, uh, put it this way, we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dare believe, yet more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Uh, Hebrews 4, and I think that's actually an ancient sermon, so another preacher it says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Now, that's our confession of faith. Uh, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's the goal of these penitential resources, that we could draw near to the throne of grace, that we'd receive mercy and find grace uh, to help in time of need. And that's designed to lead to gratitude uh, and to love. Archbishop Thomas Cramner, who designed um, the early forms of most of these liturgies, um, designed them as a context for us to encounter grace 
and respond with gratitude so that our love and our affections would be rightly directed towards God. In fact, Archbishop Cramner's remedy against future sin is that, an increased love of God. He once wrote, what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. And so all of the penitential resources, really all of the resources of our prayer book, aim for a renovation and a transformation of the heart. And it aims for a renovation and a transformation of what we love as the path uh, for holiness. So let's talk about what we have in terms of um, penitential resources. Um, first, and you may not know this, um, I learned a lot when I was preparing this lesson. Um, there are actually three different general confessions of sin uh, in the 2019 prayer book. Um, you may be very familiar with the one that we have for the daily office, morning prayer and evening prayer. This is a fairly familiar confession of sin. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. So we have this general confession, um, and we see that it appears all over the place. Um, it's a very common thing for us. And most of us will begin learning this by heart. Um, if we're using it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, it has some memorable phrases. Um, actually, that turn of phrase, we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. Um, at one point, that actually says we have followed too much the desires and devices of our own hearts. Um, that was in an early draft, but that familiar form was so familiar, devices and desires, uh, that they switched it up and put it back together. And so then after we have this kind of daily office prayer, um, what we'll find is there are two other uh, confessions of sin, these general confessions that we confess together in the two different communion services. Um, and these are helpful to look at, these general confessions of sin. They have similarities and differences. Uh, one thing you'll notice if you hang around Anglicans or really any liturgically minded Christians is they love to use this Latin phrase, uh, lex orende, lex credendi. Um, it, it basically means the law of prayer is the law of belief. And the basic idea is that you can learn a lot about our theology by looking at our liturgy. And that one of the primary ways of forming our people theologically is through the actual liturgy of the church. And so with that in mind, let's look at these general confessions of sin. What do we learn about our theology? How are these confessions seeking to shape and form us? Um, and the first thing I notice in this particular confession of sin is we see this metaphor that we are like lost sheep. Um, over and over again, the prayer book uses this imagery um, that God is our shepherd, we are his sheep, we are part of his flock, this larger group called the church, um, and in our sinfulness, we are then lost and wayward. Um, we are sheep who have wandered off the path. And this, of course, is a rich uh, biblical image, um, and we actually find that it's linked to the work of Jesus, who uh, Isaiah 53 writes of Jesus as the suffering servant, and it uses uh, this imagery. Here's what the prophet says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds, we are healed. So we have this uh, prophetic, poetic vision of the cross. And then the prophet continues, all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You can see that undergirding this confession of sin. I'm also reminded uh, of Luke 15 and other places where Jesus tells these parables about a lost sheep. 
Uh, you might know the one in Luke 15, uh, that passage, we have three parables. Uh, the first one is the lost sheep, and then the third one is probably more well-known, the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, but the first one, Jesus asks, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So even in just this very first phrase uh, of this confession of sin, that we are like lost sheep, um, we're also holding out the hope that we will not just be lost sheep, but we will be found sheep, found and pursued by the good shepherd, um, the Lord Jesus. So um, let's look at this next confession of sin. Uh, this comes from there. Again, I mentioned there are two um, Holy Communion or Eucharist services in the prayer book. We'll look at those next week. The first is the Anglican Standard Text. Um, and look at this confession. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker and judge of us all, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and offenses which we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your righteous anger against us. We are deeply sorry for these our transgressions. The burden of them is more than we can bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may evermore serve and please you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so if you look at this particular confession of sin, this penitential resource, um, you'll see that the prayer book emphasizes the righteousness and holiness of God. Um, and then the prayer book also differentiates, or you see the variety of the sins we commit. Um, those are often called sins of commission, things that we do. And it, you have this memorable phrase, ways that we sin in thought, word, and deed. Um, again, these really, uh, these, these, these memorable turns of phrase are very helpful because you can also just use that framework. If you're reviewing your day or journaling or doing an exam in the evening, you can just kind of catalog, how's my day been? Um, what have I thought? What have I said? What have I done um, that I might need to confess for? You have that, um, that, that variety that you can think through that taxonomy of thought, word, and deed. And we also see in this particular uh, confession an emphasis on the burden of sin. Um, I think that probably uh, many of us who um, are, are either raised in the church or not raised in the church, um, we tend to think of sin as, as fun. <laughs> It's things we do to please ourselves. Um, and here, the prayer book just wants to remind us that this actually lays a burden on us. Um, it's intolerable. It's more than we can bear. And so we need the Lord to come and lift the burden uh, of our sin. We see that in this general confession of sin. Um, and then the third one we have is from the second communion service, the renewed ancient text. Um, and all this means, by the way, the Anglican Standard Text is a communion service following traditional Anglican patterns of, of liturgy. And this renewed ancient text is more of an ecumenical service um, that will sound pretty similar to some of the services you might find in a Roman Catholic church after um, the Second Vatican Council. Or just it kind of it takes into account some of the ecumenical consensuses uh, of the last century. That, that's all they're saying by Anglican Standard Text, renewed ancient text. Um, this is the, the main service we use at St. Thomas Anglican Church, so you would be familiar with this if you regularly worship with us. Um, and it's more similar to the daily office. Uh, you see in this confession of sin an emphasis, and this is a, a, a wonderfully unique Anglican emphasis on sins of commission, things done, and then sins of omission, things left undone. And so we would pray together most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, um, again, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. Uh, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Uh, amen. Um, actually, if you think about what's unique in this confession of sin, 
um, we actually see that sin is rooted here in a failure to love. Um, this has a re very relational aspect to it, whereas um, the confession of sin in the other Sunday service has more of a legal aspect. Uh, both of those are important, and I appreciate that we have that variety um, provided in the prayer book. Um, but here we are, we are asking forgiveness for our failure to love, to love God uh, and to love our neighbor. Um, and then, of course, all of these confessions of sin will ask for forgiveness, and they, they involve not simply sorrow for sin, but committing again to a path of holiness. We turn from sin and turn to the Lord um, and his ways. Um, in my experience, these confessions of sin become the most well-known to us. They're, they're the penitential resources that come to mind when we think about uh, bringing our sin before the Lord because we use them all the time. Um, when we fall into sin and we need to repent and confess specific sins, um, these can be guides and aids for the process, even as standalone resources. Again, you can go through and pray, um, how have I sinned in thought? How have I sinned in word? How have I sinned in deed? Um, what if I neglected or left undone? How have I failed to love God or love my neighbor? It helps us to just slow down and take inventory. We can use these resources um, in those ways. Um, and so that's what we would see in the daily office and the Sunday services. But, um, and you may be fairly familiar with these. If you've come to St. Thomas on a regular basis or another Anglican church, you're used to a confession of sin uh, probably being part of the service. Uh, but there's actually some full-on penitential services as well. And so I do want to look at those resources um, that we have in the prayer book. We're going to look at a few of the pastoral resources related to these ideas. Um, and if we have time, I think we will. I want to briefly talk about um, Ash Wednesday, um, which is really a whole season of the church year uh, devoted to these themes. And so if you will, let's take a look here at these penitential resources um, these specific, if you see the table of contents, you have the daily office, so those devotional resources that we've covered the last few weeks, um, and then you have this whole section, the Great Litany uh, and the Decalogue, before you get to uh, the Eucharist services. And, and this middle section, the Great Litany and the Decalogue, uh, is often ignored or overlooked, but they are really important to take a look at, especially if we're going over uh, the prayer book as a whole. Um, these specific resources, they can be used on their own, um, or if you read through, you'll see provisions for how to combine them with, let's say, morning prayer, or how they can be used as the front part, for example, of a communion service or before communion service. It's, it's designed to be very, very flexible. Um, for example, it's common to actually take the great litany, this long confession we'll look at in a moment, and replace one of those confessions of sin that we just talked about. Uh, for the first Sunday of Advent, the first Sunday of Lent, or other days of fasting or solemnity. For example, um, many will pray the Great Litany as their confession of sin on Fridays, if they're doing morning prayer. And they use Friday as a comprehensive day to reflect on the week as a whole, and to just take more time to think about their sin, mindful that Friday um, is the day that we, we remember the cross of our Lord Jesus. So there's that connection between um, our sin and our Savior, and what he's done for us on the cross. Um, there are italicized uh, rubric instructions uh, for the supplication. You'll see under that it says Great Litany and Supplication, where you can weave that into the Great Litany itself. Um, and actually, what's really unique, I'll turn to it um, here in the prayer book. Um, the supplication uh, is this unique little prayer service. Um, and if you read through it, uh, it actually says, for use in the litany and place of the verse and colic. I'm on page 97 in the prayer book. Um, or at the end of morning or evening prayer, or as a separate devotion. And then listen to this. The supplication is especially appropriate in times of war or of great anxiety or of disaster. And so, for example, um, during the last few weeks and months, uh, we've been dealing with uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. And early on, when I gathered our vestry, our leadership, uh, on a Zoom meeting call, uh, we prayed um, the great litany and supplication together, um, taking that cue from the prayer book to offer these prayers um, in times of great anxiety um, and in times of disaster. 
And it just reminds me that these penitential prayers give us words to pray when we are at a loss for words. Um, they help us articulate things. Um, and then the other thing we'll see is the Decalogue. Um, the Decalogue is on page 100 in your prayer book. Um, and that's just a fancy word for the Ten Commandments. <laughs> um, and so the Ten Commandments are here in a, in a call and response participatory form. Um, and they're often used even during like the Lent services during the season of Lent. Um, we'll front load the service with the Ten Commandments um, to just have a penitential tone to that. Um, and so these are included um, here for us. So let's look at these individually. Um, first, the great litany and the supplication. Um, and I'm going to spend a little time on this because I'm not sure. Again, I think these are generally overlooked um, and, and often ignored. Um, but if you look at the great litany, it's on page 91. Uh, the first thing you need to know is that the word litany comes from Greek, where it just referred to prayer uh, or supplication. Um, in, in modern usage, it's been narrowed down to refer to the specific type of prayer which the people are making fixed responses to short biddings um, or petitions. We're, we're familiar with this kind of call and response format in the prayer book. And here, the Great Litany, we have this call and response confession together um, that we can do. And again, we, we learned this from the Psalms and from the early church, this basic back and forth structure. Um, and so uh, we're used to this, even this kind of call and response from Things like the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God prayer in the prayer book, the Kyrie, the Lord have mercy. Again, we see it over and over again. And some of us just think of that as a liturgical uh, form. And um, the great litany itself, we see forms of it throughout church history. Um, and that the great litany in the Anglican tradition was actually the first service published officially in English. Uh, Thomas Cramner had edited and compiled various medieval litanies, and uh, a litany that uh, Martin Luther put together, and a litany of St. John Chrysostom, and he edited these and kind of ran them through a, a Reformation funnel, um, and it was published in 1544 as a special prayer for the nation when Henry VIII was at war with Scotland and France. Um, and you would see all these instructions in the early prayer books of when exactly you should pray uh, the Great Litany and the Supplication. And often you would pray them uh, two days a week or during certain Sundays um, of the year. Um, in just a moment, we'll walk through it and you'll see how comprehensive and beautiful and long uh, the Great Litany here uh, in the prayer book is. Again, we're on page 91 if you want to follow along. And then when we get to one optional section, I'll show you the different paths you can take. But just at an overview level, you'll see there's this very unique, Cramner kind of puts this in here, there's a unique fourfold prayer for mercy um, to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then comprehensively to our triune God. That's followed by 38, yes, 38 um, different prayers and petitions. Uh, following that, we have the Agnus Dei, also known as Lamb of God, um, so you might be familiar with that from a service, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. And then again, the Kyrie, Lord have mercy upon us. Um, and then there's a flexible ending. Sometimes that segues into the communion service. Sometimes that can segue into the supplication. That's why they're joined together. Um, and then if you use it on its own, you would actually conclude with the Lord's Prayer, um, a back and forth verse, the collect, and the grace. Um, so in many ways, this is almost like these various widgets we've gotten pretty familiar with in the daily office. We see them rearranged and coming together in different ways uh, for the Great Litany. So let, let's read through this. Um, I think we have time. Um, we're just, we're about, what, 20, 25 minutes into our class. Um, and you'll notice that it says that this can be said or sung, uh, kneeling, standing, or in procession. And so it would be common, for example, on the first Sunday of Lent, Instead of an opening processional hymn, all the clergy might come into something like this, the Great Litany. Um, and probably they would get to the front of the church before they were done and continue praying it. So listen to this prayer. O oh God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy upon us. O oh God the Son, redeemer of the world, have mercy upon us. O oh God the Holy Spirit, sanctifier of the faithful, have mercy upon us. O oh holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, one God, 
have mercy upon us. And now we have these 38 prayers and petitions. Remember not, Lord Jesus, our offenses, nor the offenses of our forebears, neither reward us according to our sins. Spare us, good Lord. Spare your people whom you have redeemed with your most precious blood, and by your mercy, preserve us forever. Spare us, good Lord, is the response. From all evil and wickedness, from sin, from the works and assaults of the devil, from your wrath and everlasting condemnation. And they respond, good Lord, deliver us. From all blindness of heart, from pride, vanity, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and from all lack of charity, good Lord, deliver us. Turn to page 92. From all disordered and sinful affections, and from all the deceit of the world, the flesh, and the devil, Good Lord, deliver us from all false doctrine, heresy, and schism, from hardness of heart and contempt of your word and commandments. Good Lord, deliver us from lightning and tempest, from earthquake, fire, and flood, from plague, pestilence, and famine. Good Lord, deliver us from all oppression, conspiracy, and rebellion, from violence, battle, and murder, and from dying suddenly and unprepared. Good Lord, Deliver us by the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity and submission to the law, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation. Good Lord, deliver us by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial. Good Lord, deliver us by your glorious resurrection and ascension, by the sending of your Holy Spirit, by your heavenly intercession, and by your coming again in power and great glory. Good Lord, deliver us. In times of tribulation, in all times of prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment, good Lord, deliver us. We've seen this long litany already, the series of sins that we've committed, and then we're reminded how the Lord has delivered us. And so now we'll see a shift at the bottom of page 92. We sinners beseech you to hear us, O Lord God, that it may please you to rule and govern your holy church and the universal in the right way. The response is, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord. And so now we're praying for things. These are our petitions. To illumine all bishops, priests, and deacons with true knowledge and understanding of your word, that both by their preaching and living, they may show it accordingly. Be, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord. To send forth laborers into your harvest, to prosper their work by your Holy Spirit, to make your saving health known unto all nations, and to hasten the coming of your kingdom. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord to give all your people increase of grace, to hear your word with humility, to receive it with pure affection, and to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to give us a heart to love and fear you, and diligently to keep your commandments. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to bless and keep all your people. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord that it may please you to rule the hearts of your servant. And here you can pray for the president or the sovereign or the prime minister, depending on what country you're in, and to all others in authority, that they may do justice and show mercy and walk humbly before you. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to bless and guide all judges, giving them grace to execute justice and to maintain truth. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to bless and keep our armed forces by sea and land and air to shield them, in all dangers and adversities, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to bless and protect all who serve their communities by their labor and learning. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to give and preserve for us and for others the bountiful fruits of the earth so that the harvest we may all enjoy them. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to make wars to cease in all the world and to give to all nations unity, peace, and concord. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, that it may please you to show mercy on all prisoners and captives, refugees, the homeless and the hungry, and on all those who are desolate and oppressed. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to preserve all who are in danger by reason of their work or travel. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to strengthen the bonds of those in holy matrimony, to uphold the widowed and abandoned, and to comfort all whose homes are torn by strife. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to protect the unborn and their parents, and to preserve all women in childbirth. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to care for those who have lost children or face infertility. 
and to provide for young children and orphans, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to visit the lonely and those who grieve, to strengthen all who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, and to comfort with your presence those who are failing and infirm, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to support, help, and deliver all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to have mercy upon all people, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord, that it may please you to give us true repentance, to forgive us all our sin, negligence, and ignorance, and to endue us with the grace of your Holy Spirit, to amend our lives according to your holy word, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to strengthen those who stand, to encourage the faint-hearted, to raise up those who fall, and finally to beat down Satan under our feet, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to grant to all the faithful departed eternal life and peace, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord, to grant that in the fellowship of all the saints we may attain to your heavenly kingdom, we beseech you to hear us, good Lord. And we'll have another shift at the bottom of page 95, but you can see how this is a combination, confession of sin and long prayers of the people. And now it gets pretty personal. The bottom of page 95, Son of God, we beseech you to hear us. Son of God, we beseech you to hear us. And then the on you stay. O Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Christ, hear us. And then the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And then you'll see that at the middle of page 96, we have a couple places we can go. Um, if, if you're using this as part of a communion service, then you would just flow into the rest of the communion service. Um, again, this is pretty common on the first Sunday of Lent or the first Sunday of Advent, that you would go through all of this together. Um, in a time of natural disaster or, or war or trouble, if you want to use a supplication, you would then jump over to the supplication. So let me do that for us. It's at the bottom of page 97. O Lord, arise and help us and deliver us for your name's sake. O God, we have heard with our ears and our forebears have declared to us the noble works that you did in their days and in the time before them. O Lord, arise and help us and deliver us for your name's sake. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O Lord, arise and help us and deliver us for your name's sake. From our enemies, defend us, O Christ. Graciously behold our afflictions with pity. Behold the sorrows of our hearts. Mercifully forgive the sins of your people. With favor, hear our prayers, O Son of David. Have mercy upon us. Be pleased to hear us, O Christ. Graciously hear us, O Christ. Graciously hear us, O Lord Christ. And there's a concluding collect. Um, if you're going to use the litany on its own, if you go back to page 96, you just pray the Lord's Prayer. And again, then there's a short closing, um, a collect at the end, and the grace. And so again, this is an incredibly uh, long, thorough, comprehensive, flexible penitential resource. And it can be used in public worship. It can be used um, during times of penitence. Um, or again, it's very common that, um, that folks would pray this once a week to kind of take an extended inventory um, of their own uh, need for confession and an extended opportunity to pray uh, for these various needs and to bring those before the Lord. Um, so again, this is the great litany um, and the supplication. And then following that, we have uh, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And you'll see that that starts on page 100. Um, Basic catechesis in the church, how we would disciple folks, or we would say, these are the things you need to know. Um, they always revolve around three things, the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments. Um, if you pick up this book, this is our catechism to be a Christian. Um, there's a, a, an overview of the Ten Commandments, and then it goes into each one of these individually um, and how they form us as Christians. Um, this catechism says when we think about the Ten Commandments, we should understand them as God's righteous rules for life in his kingdom. Basic standards for loving God and my neighbor. Um, 
And of course, if you're familiar with an Anglican service, there's often uh, what we call a summary of the law, where we say we're, we remind ourselves that um, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God uh, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, there's no commandment greater than these. Um, so sometimes we use that basic summary from the Lord Jesus, or we might actually use all of the Ten Commandments. We might even use them in this kind of responsive uh, form. And I actually really appreciate this responsive form. Uh, we have a commandment, and then the people say, Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. And then the very last, it says, Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these your laws in our hearts. We beseech you. Um, what the prayer book has done, and I, I just think it's, it's, it's beautiful and it's brilliant, um, is it's actually saying, let's look at the Ten Commandments uh, through the lens of the new covenant and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit upon God's people. Um, if you remember, the prophet Jeremiah told of a new covenant. He said, behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, uh, not with uh, the covenant, not or not like the covenant I made with their fathers. Um, as he goes further, Jeremiah says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And that's what this, uh, this form, this liturgical form of the Decalogue envisions is that as we pray the Ten Commandments, as we think about God's law, and we realize that God, by the Holy Spirit, by the promises of the new covenant, is writing these laws upon our hearts and forming us um, into the image and likeness of Christ. Um, and so again, you can take these Ten Commandments, and it can be used as a penitential resource in worship, um, and you can use this, like these other resources, as a diagnostic tool for self-reflection. You could go through and literally look at, all right, where have I um, committed idolatry and put other things before the Lord? Um, man, when have I, um, you know, when have I taken the name of the Lord your God in vain? When have I lied? When have I coveted? Um, when you read, um, you shall not murder, you probably mentally will think about Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount saying, if I look at someone with anger in my heart, you know, you, you can catalog through that way. Um, analyzing where we have broken these commandments in order, in order to repent and return to the Lord and ask God to keep doing his work by the Holy Spirit um, on our hearts. So um, those are uh, that middle section of penitential resources. Um, I do want to point out another section. Again, we're taking an overview of all these resources, kind of a survey. Um, and this way, the, there are specific pastoral rites that uh, one is called reconciliation of penitence. So of course it's a penitential resource. And then you'll see penitential features in our ministry to the sick and in our ministry to the dying. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, if you turn to page 222 in the prayer book, um, it kind of opens the section. I've got the table of contents there on the slide. Uh, but if you turn to page 222, um, it has an overview of what we're talking about. When we're looking at these rites of healing. Um, three of them, reconciliation of penitence, ministry to the sick, and communion of the sick. And at the bottom, it says, because physical, emotional, and spiritual healing are often interrelated, it is particularly appropriate to encourage confession, reconciliation, and forgiveness in the context of ministry to the sick. Um, and then, by the way, it lets you know, the content of a confession is not normally a matter of subsequent discussion, the secrecy of a confession is morally binding for the confessor. It is not to be broken. It says these rights are foundational to the many ways that the church ministers to those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. And so that's the backdrop for this uh, pastoral right called reconciliation of penitence. Um, I just want to highlight, especially even if you're at St. Thomas, this may be a pretty new thing for you. Uh, in many ways, it's kind of an Anglican version of what we would think of as confession in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, in, in my thinking, it's, it's a pastoral rite somewhere between uh, a Roman confession and a closed booth and a one-on-one -on -one pastoral meeting. It's somewhere in between those two. Um, and I will say, if you're at St. Thomas, um, you can make an appointment with me to go through this liturgy. Uh, during the COVID-19 period, we'd have to keep social distance, of course. Uh, but it's very common during Lent or Holy Week that I'll have uh, appointments and go through this with some of our members who want to kind of 
um, take time, maybe even annually, to really go through um, a thorough inventory um, of their sins that they need to confess. And so we do the reconciliation of penitence. Um, the way I think about this is a, a meme we use often uh, in the Anglican Church, all may, some should, none must. So no one's going to make you do this. Um, anyone can do it, and some probably should. So that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the reconciliation of penitence, this kind of Anglican confession slash pastoral meeting. Um, and I will say there's a few verses that, that help me understand how to think about this in the Anglican church. I, I was not raised um, in the Anglican church. And so some of these are, are, are not natural instincts for me necessarily of how I think about um, expressing my own spirituality. Um, and so here's, here's some verses. First Timothy 2.5 clearly says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So I want to take out any idea that I am the mediator. Um, there's one mediator, the man Christ Jesus. But balance this with what James says in chapter 5. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And so, again, the scripture would make it clear. We have one mediator, the Lord Jesus, but James is pretty clear as well. Uh, there are authorized leaders that are given to the church, and there is the spiritual formation process and value in confessing our sins to one another and praying for one another that's effective. It says here that they may be healed, that it has great power. Um, God gives leaders to the church for pastoral care and ministry, and they do their ministry. They exercise their authority um, as those uh, rooted in the mediating work of Christ. Um, they exercise authorized leadership. Um, reconciliation of penitence is not something we, we encourage everyone to do. It is done with clergy because clergy are trained and held accountable for this specific ministry. Uh, by the way, remember that Latin phrase we used, lex orendi, lex credendi, the law of prayer is the law of belief. Um, this may fire some questions in your mind about an Anglican theology of ordination um, related to things like, wait a minute, why, can, why do we have only priests do this in the prayer book? Um, and so there is a section of the ordination service. That's in the prayer book as well. We won't look at that in depth. Uh, but you see a little bit of our theology of ordination um, when a new priest is ordained. Um, here's what the bishop prays for them. Almighty God and most merciful Father of your infinite love and goodness, you have given your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and the author of everlasting life after he had made perfect our redemption by his death and resurrection and ascended into heaven. He sent into the whole world his apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. By the Holy Spirit, through their labor and ministry, he gathered together a great flock to set forth the eternal praise of your holy name. For these, these great benefits, and because you have called this your servant, so that, again, they're praying over a new uh, person being ordained, because you have called this your servant to the same office and ministry, we offer you our most hearty thanks. And we humbly ask that we may daily increase in the knowledge and faith of you and of your Son, that by this minister, as well as by those entrusted to his care, your holy name may forever be glorified and your blessed kingdom enlarged through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so our theology of ordination is not that we're a different um, category or class of Christian, but that by the Holy Spirit, God sets apart leaders, men and women, uh, for his church to accomplish these tasks uh, by the Holy Spirit. Um, and actually, in the ordination service, this is followed uh, by one of those prayers that, that some of us will feel the tension. You, you can hear the tension between the Catholic tradition of the church and the principles of the Reformation. And the bishop prays this, Receive the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a priest in the church of God, now committed to you by the imposition of our hands. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Um, the Roman Catholic Church will call these the keys, that you hold those. And we would say that God does work through his leaders by the Holy Spirit um, to announce and proclaim forgiveness and absolution. The bishop prays, be a faithful minister of God's holy word and sacraments in the name of the Father 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So again, this is not that the priest is the mediator, but that they do have authority to act and speak on behalf of the Lord Jesus with the authorization and accountability of the church. Um, again, I, I've actually found that the idea of this right of reconciliation, uh, the biggest hurdle really is those who come from very Protestant backgrounds. They're, they're unsure why you would do this um, with a priest. And so that's why I go over a little bit of that theology of ordination. Um, and then really for a Roman Catholic parishioner, if they have that background, I have to let them know um, my role here is to help guide uh, this interaction with the Lord Jesus and to have this, this pastoral moment together. Um, you know, there's those hurdles in either direction. And so on page 223, you see the actual right. And, and, and this, unlike the litany, is very short. Um, most of the work happens in a fill-in-the-blank section, but it can often be a fairly long meeting together. And so on page 223, you'll see the service. Um, the person, the penitent, begins, Bless me, for I have sinned. And the priest says, The Lord be in your heart and upon your lips, that you may truly and humbly confess your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, amen. And then the person, uh, the penitent, prays, I confess to Almighty God, to His church, and to you, that I have sinned by my own fault, and thought, word, and deed, and things done, and left undone. Those should sound familiar. And then it says, especially blank. <laughs> and there's this long fill in the blank where um, the person can, can let the priest know what they're confessing, um, what weighs on their conscience. Um, and then the prayer continues. Uh, for these and all of their sins that I cannot now remember, I am truly sorry. I pray God have mercy on me. I firmly intend a moment of life, and I humbly beg forgiveness of God and his church and ask you, for counsel, direction, and absolution. And then we see another little italicized portion. Here the priest may offer counsel, uh, direction, and comfort. And so this um, can be a fairly long process. Um, in terms of the mechanics, again, we're, we're generally not in a confessional booth, but we might be seated in a quiet area. Um, it may be that the, the, there's a pray to you where the penitent can kneel, um, and I often am not looking at them eye to eye. I'm, I'm alongside them as they make their confession, and I'm, I'm guiding it. That's the, that's the posture. That's the idea. Um, and then again, following it, there's a short time of counsel, direction, comfort. I may say, hey, here's what comes to mind as you talk about that. Um, here's some steps you may need to take for um, amendment or how to, how to rectify a wrong that has been done. And then there's an absolution of sin. Uh, I declare um, the Lord's absolution of sin. And so it's a very, actually pretty short service. Um, and I would just say that in terms of whether you, um, th this is a controversial service in terms of those who are more Roman Catholic or Protestant and they're leaning. Um, to me, um, the goal is not to get tripped up in that classic debate, but to avail yourselves of this pastoral right for reconciliation to the Lord. Um, I will say whenever I have led folks in this service, it has been a powerful spiritual moment. Um, in, in many of the churches I've served, both Christ Church in Plano, Texas, and now St. Thomas Anglican Church in Athens, Georgia, uh, we draw a lot of people from outside of the Anglican tradition. And so for many of them, when we go through this service, it's their first time ever doing it. Um, and it's a powerful moment with them. Um, when I served at Christ Church in Plano, Texas, one of my favorite things is we used to take um, groups away for silent retreats. We would spend time in silence, um, praying and reading and meditating and listening uh, for the Lord. And usually about halfway through those retreats, I would offer um, this right, the right of reconciliation by appointment. If you wanted to come make an appointment with me, um, I would guide you through this service, but what was unique is that you probably had not spoken um, in 24 to 48 hours other than to go through the, uh, the prayer offices of the church. And so it allowed someone to actually be quiet long enough to hear and to do the self-reflection needed uh, to do a thorough inventory in this way for uh, the reconciliation of the penitent. Again, I've seen it be a powerful tool uh, for spiritual formation, and I would especially commend it um, during Lent and Holy Week. We'll have appointments for that at St. Thomas uh, next year during Lent. 
in Holy Week, um, assuming we're all able to, to meet and, and resume things more normally. So, all right, I want to mention one last thing before we wrap up. Again, this is a little bit longer of a session as we try to survey all these different penitential resources. Uh, but here's what it is, is we do have um, a liturgy. It's, you can see it on page 542 uh, for a service, the Ash Wednesday service. And in some ways, Ash Wednesday is a, is a whole penitential service that begins a whole penitential season. Um, look at the remarks about the service. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of the season of Lent, a time of penitence, fasting, and prayer in preparation for the great feast of the resurrection. Um, and in previous weeks, we talked about the idea of a sacrament. The sacraments are outward visible signs of an inward spiritual grace. Um, here, we actually see that the prayer book prescribes a penitential uh, sacramental work in the imposition of ashes. Uh, we do this once a year on Ash Wednesday. And these ashes are the outward visible signs of our inward sorrow and repentance. And not only do we impose ashes, but if you've been to an Ash Wednesday service, you'll know that they're imposed in the form of a cross. Um, it's not primarily or solely a sign of condemnation but a sign of the ultimate hope that we have in Christ. It's a visible, tangible reminder of what we said earlier from Tim Keller that marks the tone of these honest, thorough, penitential resources in the prayer book. We are more sinful and flawed than we ever dare believe yet, more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Um, and we always have the colic for Ash Wednesday as part of this. It's one of those beautiful colics. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent, create, and make in us new and contrite hearts that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So you'll have the Ash Wednesday service there. All right, that's a, a, a quick overview of the penitential resources of the prayer book. Um, next week, we'll begin um, uh, two sessions where we look at the Sunday services. We'll walk through um, those services that for some of us are very familiar, and I want us to kind of dig into uh, the biblical background for these services, answer questions you may have about the services so that you can engage them more fully um, when we come together to worship the Lord together. So I hope that this session has been helpful. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for um, watching through this video. Feel free to subscribe uh, and share this with those who might find it meaningful. Uh, but again, next week we will look at um, the worship service uh, together.